this story as we end uh, chapter 15 today. You could turn there. Anybody bring a Bible? You can turn to Acts 15 with me this morning. If not, it's okay. We'll have it on the big uh, screen behind me. And what we're going to see is a, these, these two disciples of Christ. If you don't know what a disciple is, it's a, it's a follower. It's an uh, apprentice of Jesus. They're not on, fully on the same page. And they end up actually separating from one another in their journey and what God was doing through their lives for, for a moment in time. And as we go through multiple scriptures today, I wanna just consider, if you just have this in your mind, consider that the Bible is one big story, because it is, and it ties together. And all of it is uh, pointed first and foremost to Jesus, but it's one big story. And I actually have a friend that every year at the beginning of the year, he reads in 30 days the entire Bible. He calls it the shred. And, uh, and uh, the reason he does it is he wants to just catch quickly the themes in, in this one big story of the Bible. And so what we're looking at today, if you could just think in terms of the book of Acts as one story that spans years, because when we see Barnabas and Paul, who we're looking at today, uh, it goes from one thing to another pretty quick when you're reading Acts, but it's actually years that they're building the church. And so uh, if you're taking notes today, you can write this down. The title, uh, I'm just going to call it Disagreeing Disciples. Disagreeing Disciples. Anybody ever had a disagreement before? Man, you're some agreeable people. That's amazing. Thank you for being bold. The seven people that raised your hand. That's amazing. Acts 15, 36 to 41 today. This is what it says. After some time, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. It says Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark, but Paul disagreed strongly since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. So, so he wants to go back to the other cities. Part of it is he's like, I know that these people get off track real quick. I want to correct them. That's Paul's mentality. It tells us they're, that in this sharp disagreement, they separate. Barnabas takes John Mark, sails for Cyprus. Paul chooses Silas. The belie- and, and, and as Paul leaves, the believers entrusted him to the Lord's gracious care. In other words, they're probably like, all right, Paul, you've, you've been riling us up over here for long enough. Give us some peace. Go on to the next place. Verse 41, he traveled through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches there. There's an old quote that I heard recently, and it goes like this. It says, to live above with saints we love, oh, that will be glory. But to live below with saints we know, that's quite a different story. How many know heaven is gonna be awesome? No, no disagreement, I mean, it's gonna be perfect. Somebody that came in the room and you were discouraged about uh, you, the, the extra weight or the lack of hair or whatever, woo, you're gonna have a glorified body someday. It's gonna be awesome. How many also know that here on earth, just because we're believers in the Lord, it doesn't mean that we're gonna agree on absolutely everything. Three people, it's amazing. <laughs> you just don't want to admit it. It's interesting that if you remember, we just saw a couple weeks ago this council in Jerusalem, and basically they avoid uh, a church split. And they're like, guys, we gotta understand that salvation, it's Jesus plus nothing equals everything. He did the work to save humanity. It's not circumcision, it's not the Mosaic law, it's what Jesus did, his grace by our faith, Paul writes. And so there's this moment where they almost split and they have this council. Now after that, two of the main leaders, Paul and Barnabas, are separating. And how many know there's probably a little bit more to the story? It's probably not just like, oh, I don't wanna bring John Mark. Well, okay, I'm gonna go the other way. There's a little bit more. Like when, you, when something happens in your own life, you know that there's a backstory to the different moments. There's, there's things that led up to whatever happens. And it doesn't mean today, hear me, it doesn't mean that there's unforgiveness There's just an accumulated knowledge and hopefully a little bit of wisdom. Sometimes I think that we look at men and women in scripture, we look at Paul and and these different guys and we just kind of see them as like the saints on the stained glass. And it's like, man, they were perfect. Like if I could be like Paul, whoo, that guy, I mean, he never did anything wrong and we forget that they're human just like me and you. They have problems. James tells us of, of the prophet Elijah even, that he was a man just like us. He had emotions, he had problems, he had fears, he, he had discouragement, 
He knew the times that, that he was used by God and then the times that he was lonely and felt like God was really distant. They were human. Paul and Barnabas, the same thing. They had strengths and they had weaknesses. Anybody have some strengths and some weaknesses in the church today? It should actually be really encouraging to me and you that these guys had strengths and weaknesses because what it tells me, if God can use imperfect people like them, then he can use you. He can use me. So I just wanna walk through some of what we've already seen in Acts and there's this, this common thread, I think, in these guys' personalities in their lives. Uh, then I wanna give you a, uh, just a few thoughts of application in a few minutes, but we're jumping into the, the bigger story of Acts today and Barnabas, that we just read a moment ago, he's a guy that's from the tribe of Levi, it's, it's the priestly tribe. He grew up in Cyprus, beautiful place. He, he comes to Jerusalem and there's this outpouring of the Holy Spirit and, and people are coming to know Jesus and he decides, man, there, there's a move of God, I'm gonna stay here. And it tells us in Acts 4 that he actually sells a piece of land that he owned because he wanted to build up the church and he wanted to meet the needs of the people in that area. He's known as the encourager. He knows how to lift the room when he walks in. He, he knows how to build people up. And in fact, he does it so much that his name wasn't actually Barnabas. His name was Joseph, but it tells us the apostles literally renamed the guy to Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. In Acts 11, we see that this church is planted in Antioch, and this is years down the road after Barnabas is first saved, and the apostles are concerned that it's gonna have a good foundation, that somebody's gonna be able to push the believers forward, somebody's gonna be able to build them up, somebody's gonna be able to encourage them. So who do they think to send? Barnabas. They send this guy to the, 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 the church in Antioch and, and he's encouraging them. He's, he's saying, guys, keep going, keep living this thing out. I know that the, 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 the rules and the regulations and the Mosaic law, it's something, man, it's of the past, let's do this thing. And he's a person that, that uh, you could say he wears easy on people. When you meet him, you, you like him. You, you probably know somebody like that in your life. You, you like to be around them. It's like you, you could be the meanest person in the world to them and they're still gonna be nice. They're gonna, just gonna smile. In Acts 11, verse 22, it tells us this, that about this moment when they send Barnabas to Antioch, and it says when he arrived, he saw this evidence of God's blessing. He was filled with joy and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit, strong in the faith. Many people are brought to the Lord. He's an encourager. This guy looks for common ground with people. He, he wants to make people feel good. The problem sometimes, if you're that kind of person, is that if you're not careful in your desire to make people feel good, you can water things down or even compromise in the difficult areas because you don't want to offend somebody. That's Barnabas. He's just, man, I'm gonna, whew, I got a smile on my face. I'm, I'm gonna encourage everybody all the time. Then you have Paul. <laughs> Good old Paul. He's determined. He's a, he's a guy that, 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 that he's well-educated. He, in fact, he studied under the best of that day. One of the guys was Gamaliel, the scripture tells us. He's one of the greatest minds of his generation. I mean, he understands the faith like nobody else. And he just has this natural intelligence. He's also competitive and he's bold. And in Philippians 3, Paul writes about his own zeal for following God. And this is before he came to know Jesus. And he literally says this, if anyone has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have even more. This is before he was following Jesus. And he lists off all these accolades and these rules that he's following. And, and he talks about, man, I went further than anybody else. I even went to the point of persecuting the people that believed in Jesus. The, the other people weren't even doing that. They didn't like him, but they weren't like going after him and throwing him in jail necessarily. In Philippians 3.6, he, he, he says it like this, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. In other words, man, I was doing it all. I was going for it. He was competitive, he was zealous, he, he was passionate, he was, he was a guy that was black and white, he's just gonna tell you like it is. Even after Paul became a believer, if you've read Corinthians, he says, hey, run your, way, run your race in such a way that you're gonna get the prize. In other words, if you're gonna play, play to win, man. He's confrontational, he's bold, he's, he's in your face, he's direct. Anybody know someone like that in your life? If you're not raising your hand, it might be you. He just goes after it. In Acts 9, we see that Paul gets saved. Shortly after Paul got saved, this is what it says. 
in verse 22, Saul became more and more powerful in his preaching. And the Jews in Damascus, they couldn't refute his proofs that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. There's just something about the way that Paul presents. It's, he, he's not going to give you a spoonful of sugar to make the medicine go down. He's like, I'm just going to shove the medicine in. You better take it. And so they think, man, we got to get rid of this guy. Like, we can't prove him wrong. And he's so bold that everybody's believing him. And it says in verse 23, after a while, some of the Jews plotted together to kill him. And they're watching and, and staying by the city gates so they could murder him. And they literally take a basket and lower Paul down through the wall. And he kind of escapes that moment. Here's the connection of Saul or Paul is his Greek name, and Barnabas. Here's the connection. In verse 26, it says, when Saul arrived in Jerusalem, after he was saved, he tried to meet with the believers, but they were all afraid of him. No wonder. They, they, they didn't believe he had truly become a believer. In other words, they're like, this dude, I mean, he, he has taken it to a new level. Now he's saying he's a believer so he can get in and kill us all. And watch this, in 27, then Barnabas brought him to the apostles and told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. Barnabas is literally operating in his gift. He's saying, hey, nobody else will, but I'm gonna encourage this guy in his faith. I'm gonna build him up. I'm, I'm gonna go to the other guys on his behalf and I don't even care if, I, if, he, if he kills me, I'm gonna do what I'm called to do. And, and, and he tells the guys, Man, this guy, the persecutor, he's changed, he's different. We gotta get to know this guy. We gotta build this guy up. He's bold. Man, this is gonna be awesome. And it tells, him, it tells us in the scripture, he also told them that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. He wouldn't expect anything different. And it says in 28 that Saul stayed with the apostles, went all around Jerusalem preaching boldly. He debated with some Greek-speaking Jews, but they tried to murder him. So it's starting to become a regular thing. Everyone wants to murder Saul. They're not, it's interesting because they're not trying to kill Peter. They're not trying to kill John. They're, it doesn't tell us they're, everybody's after Bartholomew. Everybody just doesn't like James, that, that they're even trying to get Barnabas. They all want to kill Saul, Paul. Verse 30, it says, when the believers heard about this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus, his hometown. So they want to kill Saul. They're like, all right, we need, get, we need to get him out of here again. He, went, he got a little bit too bold on us, so they put him on a boat. See ya, Paul. Have fun. And then watch this in verse 31. Then the church had peace. They enjoyed a moment of peace. And it says then later uh, in the scripture, well, I'll get to that in a second. Basically what happens right after that is they start a church in Antioch a little while later. Barnabas gets sent. We mentioned that already. And I, I, I would submit to you that Barnabas is thinking, okay, I need a good teacher here. I mean, I'm building everybody up and encouraging them, but I'm kind of at the end of my teaching. Oh yeah, Saul, he's the best. Paul, he's the, I'm gonna bring that guy in. And what we know when we see this in Acts 11 is that for years they're working together closely and they're teaching together and they got this cool partnership and, and we know that the, we would call it their first missionary trip that happens right after that. And Barnabas has this cousin named John Mark that we read at the beginning in our passage today and here's what the disagreement's about. In Acts 13, Paul and his companions, they leave, and it tells us John Mark left them and, and he returned to Jerusalem. And you would read that without the context of our chapter today, and you would say, okay, he left them, whatever. I mean, who knows what happened? He left them not in a good way. He deserted them. A lot of scholars believe that, that he just left in the middle of the night and didn't even say anything and just went back to Jerusalem. And if you think about uh, when you're on a missionary journey, especially in this day and age, but even today, you go to a place where it's like a persecuted country, like it's dangerous, like people could lose their lives, you got a plan for the mission, you got a group of people, you know what you're doing, and then somebody just leaves and abandons the plan, you're like, bro, why, are you kidding me? <laughs> Some scholars even believe that, that Barnabas, uh, not Barnabas, sorry, John Mark is the guy that actually incited the circumcision party that comes up and the reason that they had to have that whole council, he was kind of questioning potentially, some scholars would, scholars would say, like, do we have to be circumcised? Do we have to follow the Mosaic law? And it caused this whole problem. And whether that's the case or not, Paul is heated about the fact that they just got deserted by John Mark. You have to believe that Barnabas had a lot to say and Paul had a lot to say, and they weren't exactly the same in their thoughts probably. So what happens with a person like Paul? 
with that personality. I mean, if you, if you looked at something like the, the, the Enneagram or whatever, I mean, this guy was an eight. He was the challenger. He's the guy that's just blowing everything up. Like, you, you might like plan a party or, 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 or be in charge of an organization, but Paul comes and he's in charge after about like a month. Or you, you show up for the party, it's like, I, I plan this whole thing, why is Paul running it? Like that's the kind of guy that he is. And so Paul and Barnabas, they, they're continuing to work together and they're building the church in the area of what would be Turkey today, Asia Minor, and they go to this city called Poseidon Antioch and in 1344 and 45 of Acts, it tells us that the following week, almost the entire city turned out to hear them preach the word of the Lord. I'm telling you that the world needs some Pauls because he was a guy that was so bold that almost an entire city shows up like, we wanna hear what this guy has to say. And it says when some of the Jews saw the crowds, they were jealous, so they slandered Paul and they argued against whatever he said. It's interesting because both Paul and Barnabas are there. They're both part of this ministry, but who's the focus? They're mad at Paul. They, 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 it tells us in the scripture they flee later, they go to Iconium, a different city, and the Jews are so mad there that they wanna kill him. And then they go to Lystra, and a man gets completely healed, and people literally start to worship Paul, and he has to get up and be like, guys, I'm just a man, do not worship me, it's all about Jesus. And then shortly after that, they stone Paul, and somehow he makes it out of there, and Barnabas is there, but again, they're not stoning him. Never says they're mad at him, because he's just like smiling everywhere, building everybody up. After all of this stuff, I just imagine, if we could just jump into the story, I imagine Barnabas possibly talking to Paul, and he's like, Paul, bro, let me encourage you a little bit. You're so smart. Man, you're so passionate. You know, Paul, there's more than one way to say something. Everywhere we go, people are ticked off. They're so mad. Maybe if you said it just a little bit differently, I wonder if sometimes they wouldn't be quite as mad. And we know based on the story in Acts that they go back to Antioch and they're reporting all that God has done. So regardless of if Paul was a little too harsh sometimes or a little too bold or Barnabas was just a little too encouraging and not bold enough, God is working and people are being saved and people are being healed and his word is being pushed forward into the earth, it's powerful. And that's where we pick it up in, in a, couple weeks, a couple weeks ago where we saw this message that I called, Are You Saved? And they're having to say, okay, salvation is it's faith in Jesus and nothing else. It's not the other stuff. And they have this whole council where people are saying, oh, you gotta get circumcised, you gotta do all this stuff. And remember, Acts 15, it told us literally, Paul is vehemently arguing, that's what one translation says. And rightfully, thankfully so, because Paul is right, these guys are very wrong and they could lead people astray. And I wonder if Barnabas would have been too scared because he's the encourager. And in Galatians, we see more of this moment. In Galatians 5, Paul, it says, I, Paul, tell you this, if you're counting on circumcision to make you right with God, Christ will be of no benefit to you. It says, for if you're trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you've been cut off from Christ. You've fallen away from God's grace. So Paul makes it very clear all the time. <laughs> And all this stuff is happening, and then Peter shows up in one of the towns that they're in. Peter, he's eaten with the Gentiles now. And this is a big deal in that day and age. The Jews did not associate with Gentiles, but now they're saved, and they realize that God, and this gospel is for everybody, and they're eating together. But watch what happens next. Peter's eating with the Gentiles. The elders from Jerusalem, the real, like, strong Jews from the religious center of the entire country, they show up. And they're believers, but they show up and they're still practicing the law. And all of a sudden, Peter kind of changes and he's like, oh, the, it's, it's like the moment like when you were younger and your grandpa or your parents walked in the room and you're like tucking in your shirt real quick. You're like, how's everybody doing? Like, you're trying to look good. And he backs off and starts observing the Jewish law again. And this is what, this is what Paul does. Watch this. It's like nails uh, on a chalkboard for Paul, for Peter to go back and start doing all that stuff. Paul is ticked, and, and watch this, Galatians 2.11. When Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face for what he did was very wrong. Paul could have said like, hey, Peter, um, you wanna go up to like the rooftop for a minute? Like, let's just chat for a minute. Peter, bro, come on. Can I just encourage you to be a leader, bro? Don't go back into the stuff that it doesn't matter anymore. Like, keep hanging out with everybody. Do, do what you know the truth, do what's right. 
But instead, this is what happens in verse 13. It says, uh, this is what Paul writes, as a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy. Even Barnabas was led astray by the hypocrisy. And when I saw they were not following the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of all the others, since you, a Jew by birth, have discarded the Jewish laws and you're living like a Gentile, why are you now trying to make these Gentiles follow the Jewish traditions and all of a sudden you're backtracking? It's moments like this that he's just blasting them and it's like you can hear a pin drop in the room. (laughs) And I imagine that Peter and Barnabas are embarrassed because Paul's just calling them out with everybody else. And then they would shortly after this have this council in Jerusalem about the whole issue of what it means to be saved. But if you remember that these guys are human, like even they could have thought back to this moment, Barnabas and their disagreement and thought, man, Paul, you just need to be encouraging. Like you're calling everybody out all the time and there could be a little bit of hurt. We don't know. Barnabas could have been thinking that, could you have just handled this in a different way, Paul, calling us out? Like after all the times I've encouraged you, you just blast me at dinner. And I just imagine Barnabas as they're getting ready in Acts 15 to go to this council in Jerusalem saying, Paul, Bro, if you go into this thing with your guns out, like popping everybody with your words, nobody's gonna listen to you. And and, and there's this difference in personalities. And what do we see happen? Saw this a couple weeks ago. They go in there and the other guys that are with them are the ones that actually make the theological arguments. Paul kind of tames himself And it tells us that him and Barnabas get up and what do they do? All they do is simply share the miracles of God and what God has been doing all over the world through their ministry and it's powerful. So from the stories that we're looking at today, from the lives, and there's more about Paul and Barnabas, but there's this common thread where we can see, okay, Paul and Barnabas, just like us, they're very different people. One is assertive, almost to the point of uh, being combative. One's an encourager, almost to the point of potential compromise. We even saw Barnabas, he's he's going back into Peter's ways, because he's like, I just want everybody to be happy. One's in your face, the other's gentle. And the question for us today is, which is best? I think the answer is both. And you might prefer the Barnabas in our culture today and you're like, man, we just gotta be nice, like make each other feel good. It's all about feelings. But can I tell you that our world that we're living in today, we still need some Pauls. There there are some things that the person with the tenacity and the boldness and the assertiveness of someone like a Paul has to get up and say, hey, as for me and my house, we're serving the Lord. Hey, as for our church, we're headed this direction. Hey. I know that not everything is black and white, but there are some things that are black and white, and we gotta go this way because that's what God said, and we gotta do what's right. We still need that in our world today. But can I tell you, we also need the Barnabases that can come in after that and say, hey, we can do it. Let's do what's right, and somebody falls down. I'm gonna help you up because we're on a journey together. We need encouragers too. And we might, we might feel like, just, just based on our culture, we might feel better about a, a Barnabas personality and say, well, I feel like that's just kind of more godly because remember Jesus was meek and he was gentle. And can I just tell you that in Jesus' life, he was the perfect mix of everything. He flipped tables when it was necessary in the temple, but he also built people up and encouraged them. He was truth and he was grace at the same time in a beautiful way. And so we may say, well, I just... You know, I I just like the Barnabas. The Holy Spirit doesn't lead us to either direction in the stories because they're both important. I I had a staff member uh, years ago that that he was awesome. He did a great job in his area, but the dude just offended people because he was like a Paul. He he was just bold and he would just tell it like it was. And I'm like, dude, these sixth graders are crying because you're telling them just a little bit too harshly. Like the leader that's serving with you, just like tone it down a little bit. We need people like that still. I just had to have about seven conversations with him, but it was okay. On the opposite side though, I've had friends and and different family where it's like, I just want everyone to feel good and and, and just encourage. and, and, And even at the point of ignoring the truth or ignoring a situation or ignoring what's right, I'm gonna just encourage. And, and, And it leads to compromise. So I wanna go back for just a moment to our passage from today, the end of 15, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back to the churches. 
Barnabas is like, okay, let's do it. But, but we gotta bring John Mark. What did it tell us? Paul disagrees strongly since John Mark deserted them. The, the, the word in the Greek for deserted is aspostanta, and it literally is like apostatize or unfaithful. And, and, and Paul, he's essentially saying, man, he's not going, <laughs> he's not coming with us. He left, I mean, the dude acted like more wimpy than the wimpiest of the wimpy in that moment back there. Remember that, Barnabas? Barnabas is like, man, Paul, he's my cousin. He's been growing, I, I know that he's not quite the same. I mean, he's coming, Paul. And it tells us, what, what does it say? Their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. The Greek word used is, some, some scholars have tried to downplay this. This was a serious disagreement. The Greek word is paroxysmos, and it's like an outburst or a provocation, or there's, there's some excitement involved if you've ever had an exciting conversation with your spouse. You know what I'm talking about, exciting. There's a back and forth, like imagine this. Pa Paul's over here. Dude is not going. Bar Barnabas, Paul, he's going. You, you gotta know, he's going. Bar no, he's not going. He's going, he's not, he's going. He's go they're going back and forth. <laughs> and you just imagine this happening. There's this grinding of, of personalities and what they think they need to do. And, and, and Barnabas is like, Paul, we gotta give people a second chance. Remember, that's the heart of the Lord. It's, it's my cousin, bro, it's my family. <laughs> and Paul is like, yeah, I understand what you're saying and it's true, but you also gotta have people that you can count on. We can't be babysitting this dude on our missions trips. Like, we, we, when times are tough, I need a team I can count on. Abandonment is serious on the mission field. He's not ready. So you ask the question, who's right? Both. Who sinned? Neither. Sometimes you can come to a moment, and we don't, we don't really ever talk about this, you can come to a moment where people disagree and it doesn't mean that it's time to take sides or, or try to say, okay, we really gotta discern what's right or wrong. It's just a simple, man, we just don't see it the same way. And hear me, this is not the someone sinned against someone else and they disagreed about it, that's a different thing. Two people can be right with a different perspective and, the, and they may not be able to go forward together for a season. There, there's moments where people just see things differently. And it doesn't mean that, that someone's wrong or right. It doesn't mean that there's unforgiveness. We have no reason to think that there was any bitterness or unforgiveness with either of these guys. And what did it tell us in the scripture? Barnabas takes John Mark, they go to Cyprus. Paul takes Silas and they travel through Syria and Cilicia, they're strengthening the churches. I want you to just note this morning that both of them went and they continued to minister and do the will of God and see his hand at work even when it was in different places. In fact, I, I, I would even think about Barnabas, he's going back to where he's from in Cyprus. Maybe he's saying, okay, I'm gonna take John Mark somewhere where it's easy, where if he tries to leave, I'm a, I know every street in this town, I'm gonna find him real quick. Or, or, or it's comfortable, that's where we're from, and I'm gonna train him up, and I'm gonna encourage him, and I'm gonna help him to, to be bold in his, in his faith a little bit, and, and encourage people like I do. And it, it, here's the idea, they didn't let disagreement keep them from doing the will of God. A few principles for you, and then I wanna pray for you before we go. If, if a disagreement occurs with a believer, can I just encourage you, don't publicly attack their character Character assassins are not honoring to the Lord. Facebook character assassins, I, I, just, I just don't see Jesus doing that. It's one thing to disagree on an issue, but, but it's another to think that you can read someone's heart and you just like assassinate them. Don't accuse someone based on your feelings. Well, I just feel like he's this way. Do you know his heart? Probably not. Well, I just feel like she's jealous. I mean, she looked at me. She looked at me with a side eye. Can you believe it? Stay, that is not honoring to the Lord. Jeremiah 17, when, when you're trying to read someone's heart, Jeremiah 17 said the heart is wicked above all things. Who can know it? We don't even know our own heart that well. We need, we need a savior and we're focused on trying to read theirs and, and project things on how, how we think they are and we don't even really know. I've seen a lot of character assassination in the past few years in the polarization of whatever different stuff in our country, especially 2020. I mean, I, I just wonder if sometimes if it was just because people were bored. <laughs> I, I remember one moment, there was a person that 
they were like attacking me because I didn't post the same like square on Instagram or whatever that everybody else did. And I'm like, and I'm like, bro, this stuff is ridiculous for believers. The back and forth, it makes us no different than the world. There is no place for that kind of stuff. In, in those that are called to be light, it is not helping our mission when we're, when we're at war on Facebook just like everybody else or Twitter or TikTok or Snapchat or whatever your age demographic is, you're using one of them probably. I would also encourage you this morning to continue to seek God's will. Don't mistake, can I just add this? Don't mistake God's will for your own. I think a lot of us in life sometimes, we, we're like, well, God told me to do this, and it's like, no, the pizza last night told you to do it, and it just sounds cool to you. That, that's why you need some wise counsel around you in your life and some people that are praying for you and some people that are saying, hey, this is what I would do, and, and, and here's a, maybe a better direction, or man, go for it, that's awesome. I, I, can, I, you know, I can confirm that that's the right. Just be careful when you use, God told me, it's a dangerous place to be, because he does speak to us, but we don't want to abuse his will. And if you don't get your way in a disagreement with another believer, don't stop doing God's will. I know there, there, there's some people in the world through history that are like, well, I didn't like the way they did it, so I'm out, I quit. We can't be those kind of people. We gotta, we gotta say, I'm gonna continue to seek God's will. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep walking in my calling. I'm not gonna just rehearse whatever the, the argument was for years and recruit an army of people to come over here and, and become a master manipulator so everyone can see how much smarter I am than the person that I agree with. Be big enough to say, hey, I mean, I just, I just don't agree with somebody, but I love them and I'm gonna keep serving God and I'm gonna let the fruit of my life show it and I hope that they will too. Sometimes, not all, not all the time, probably not that often, but sometimes separation is the best solution. And, and it's interesting in the text today that the church and the Holy Spirit, they don't force these guys back together right away. They were actively continuing to serve God, the same God that the Bible tells us that he works all things together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. That's who those guys are both working with in different areas for a season. And is it sad in that moment that they're kind of like, man, the, the, the duo that was setting the world on fire for Jesus in an awesome way? Sure, it might have been. Does the Holy Spirit show us that there was any sin and that was the problem? No. Sometimes there, there is a moment where it's the sin of another person. That's a different situation, but we're not led to think that. Can I, I also would say disagreement, it's not an excuse for any of us in God's church to cause disunity and just have a terrible attitude and, and hurt the, the, the body and our witness as believers, God doesn't bless that kind of stuff. We got a hurting world that needs to see a church like Jesus said that they, he, you will know them by their love for each other. I believe that Paul and Barnabas loved each other deeply. I don't believe that in this situation they split and they were just talking smack about each other. No, they were, they were going forward with the mission. They were probably praying for each other daily while they weren't together. I, I want you to also hear this. If the disagreeing disciple in your life is your wife, separation is not the answer. You need to go to counseling. I'm serious, someone will take that and be like, well, he said to separate, so I'm packing up as soon as I get home. No, you need to get counsel. We have a great team of people that would love to help you and meet with you and encourage you in your marriage. That's a covenant that God is right in the middle of. Last thought for you is, no matter what happens, God's mission is gonna endure through disagreement or whatever happens in life. It's not the end. I just want to encourage you, church, let's seek God and have the right attitude, the right heart. God is going to continue to lead people to build his church, to lead people into the purpose that he has for your life. If you didn't know, he's got an individual purpose for your life in this earth. It's not a mistake that you were in this room today. It's not a mistake that you were born and alive in 2023 in Arizona. Think about this, Paul. This guy had been traveling with Barnabas for years. And I'm sure that he's just getting from Barnabas like, Paul, you're so awesome. Paul, you're so smart. Paul, you're so good. I mean, he's probably feeling good every time he's with him. Now Paul is with Silas, and the Bible tells us that Silas was a prophet. If you know anything about a prophet, a prophet's bold. A prophet's a little more black and white. A, a prophet's the, the, the one that would be like, Paul, I'm gonna hold your feet to the fire for a minute on, on whatever this issue is. 
and it might have changed them and it might have been what they needed in that season. Think about what's going on. Barnabas, maybe there was a moment that he needed to be out of the shadow of Paul and, and grow a little bit more bold. And Paul at the same time is becoming a little bit more gracious potentially. I imagine Barnabas just raising up John Mark and letting him know, hey, I, I know that Paul didn't want you with us, but, but we're not gonna let previous failure keep us from God growing and, and using us. It's, whew, it's gonna be powerful, John Mark. Watch what happens as you continue to move forward and do what's right. If you think about these two personalities, sometimes you need to tap into one or the other a little bit. And some of us are, are, are really strong on one end or the other, but if you're a parent or, 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 or my brother-in-law was saying, if you're a, you're, you're a coach in the room, sometimes you don't parent or coach everybody the same way. Like you, you got the real sensitive person that you need a little bit more encouragement. You got the real hard-headed kid that you're like, bro, I just gotta kick you in, in the can and tell you, like, get it right. <laughs> That's the only thing they'll listen. Sometimes we need some boldness. Sometimes we need some encouragement. I would, I think it's important to bring this up as well because that wasn't the end of the story. We learn from Paul's letters in Colossians chapter four and in Philemon that he writes about John Mark later on. Not only in time, Paul starts to see John Mark as a reliable minister, not just deserting everything, but while he's in prison, a lot of people think it's in Rome. In 2 Timothy 4.11, it says, get Mark, this is Paul writing, and bring him with you, for he's very helpful to me in ministry. How beautiful is that? Time goes by. They didn't just stay separated. It wasn't just the end of the story. I, I imagine Paul growing in the grace of God and seeing John Mark's life and seeing the ministry and Paul realizing and remembering, hey, God doesn't give up on people. God gives them a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance and a fifth chance. Anybody thankful that God gave you a sixth chance in your life that, man, he put somebody in your life that when you were down, they encouraged and said, let me pull you back up. Let's get on track. Thank God for his grace. Thank God for the boldness of somebody that told you the truth as well about the path that you were headed down. Paul later on in his life, he says, hey, Send Mark. Of all the people Paul could have said, all the relationships, he says, hey, send Mark. He's the one that I want to see. I believe that God worked to do some beautiful things through that moment of separation. And we won't know really any of them this side of heaven. We can ask the Lord when we get there. But the big thing for us today is we got to look at people and realize, hey, all of us are real people. All of us got fear and emotion and different things. God, help us to keep our heart right in situations. Help us even when we disagree to still pray for and encourage and do what's right according to the Lord. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus. Let's walk as people that have strong character, roots that are growing. Let's seek God. Let's continue to walk in his will for our life. I wanna pray for you this morning. And I wanna pray for a couple groups of people. I just felt led based on this story and these kind of personalities to pray across the room. If you'd bow your heads, close your eyes for just a moment with me. Maybe you're in the room and you would say, hey, this week, whew, I need some of the, I need a dose of that encouragement. I need a dose of the ghost in my life and I need him to pour out some encouragement. I need the love of the dove like never before. I need, I need him to just, man, I need to be an encourager. I'm the person that I'll just tell you like it is. I'm black and white. And there's seven people this last week that were offended by me. <laughs> I need to be an encourager. Maybe you would say, I, I, I just, I need help with that, even with my own family relationships or whatever it may be at work. I, I just need the, I need the gift of encouragement. If you would be so bold, just raise your hand. I, I need God's help, be an encourager. We need encouragers in the world today. Awesome, awesome. Second group of people, I, you would say, well, I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum. Like, I, I feel like I'm, I'm pretty encouraging and I don't ever wanna, you know, make anyone uh, be uncomfortable. And, and I just, you know, a lot of times I don't even really say much. And, and my mama said, don't say anything unless it's nice. And so I, you know, I need some boldness though. 
because I, I, I've just kind of let people walk all over my faith and I never stand up for what's right. And, and I got some people in my workplace that the Lord has put on my heart and I just need to share the truth with them about God's work. And, and maybe that's you where you're just like, I need boldness like never before. Maybe, maybe you're, you're somewhere in the middle, but you just want a fresh dose of the boldness of the Holy Spirit in your life. Would you just slip up your hand? I need the boldness of God in my life. I need his help I, like never before. Awesome, hands all over the room. I wanna pray for you today. God, I just pray for both of these groups of people. Would you do what only you can do? Lord, for the people in the room that would say, I just need to be an encourager. I need this week, I need the Holy Spirit to help me to build people up in their faith, to be a person that, that I wouldn't just be a, a, a offensive and black and white and, and, and in the right times that you would help me to do that. But God, I understand that I just need a little bit of your meekness in my life. I need a little bit of, uh, of encouragement. Holy Spirit, would you help all of us in the right way this week to build somebody up, to, to catch somebody doing something right instead of just wrong and build them up. God, I pray for the people in the room that they need boldness like never before. I just believe that you are raising up a church in this area, in this region that would be bold in our faith. And so God, I just ask like Acts 2, would you do it again? Would you pour out your Holy Spirit? Would you fill us? Would there be a fresh baptism of the Spirit in our church, in our family? Would there just be a boldness like never before? Do what only you can do. God, I pray that it wouldn't just be us playing church, us being nice, but there would be a knowledge in our minds that we are against the forces of evil, the darkness that's around us, and there would be a boldness to stand up for what we believe in the right way, not in a hateful way, not in a mean way, not in a way that, but in a way that says, hey, we love you enough to tell you the truth. God, would you pour out your spirit for the people that, that are afraid in the room today, that walked in here with fear. I pray that they would understand that you did not give them a, a spirit of fear. That's not even in their DNA, but it's a power and of love and of sound mind. So God, I just ask for the power of your spirit in our church today. Thank you, Lord, for that in advance. And we're gonna give you the glory. Third group of people in the room. You're in here today and you would say, I need Jesus. I came in the room and I've been, I've been searching for, for hope and all kinds of different things. I, I, relationships haven't filled the void in my spirit. Job hasn't filled the void that I have. Money hasn't filled the void. Can I tell you, there's only one thing that can fill the void and it's not a friend, it's not a marriage, it's one person, his name is Jesus. And so today is the most important decision you could ever make in your life is one to say, I need Jesus. Maybe it's the first time, maybe you've never made that decision before or maybe you said, man, I've walked away from my faith and you thought that just showing up is what saves you. That's not what saves you. It is Jesus' grace, what he did on the cross for the sin of the world, and you by faith saying, I receive that, and I accept it, and I wanna make him the Lord of my life. It changes everything, I promise. You'll have hope for eternity. You'll have joy now. You'll know that if your world ended today, you would be in his presence. And so if you're in here, you would say, I wanna know him, I wanna come back to him today. I'm gonna ask you to just be a little bit bold, raise your hand in the air, I wanna pray for you. I need Jesus today, I wanna come back to him today. Anybody in the room? Awesome, awesome, thank you, awesome. Most important and greatest decision you can make in your life to come back or start a relationship with him. Just pray something kind of like this if you raised your hand. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, today I pray you'd forgive me of the sins that separate me from you. Jesus, thank you for what you did on the cross. Jesus, today I believe that you're the son of God and you're God himself. Today I wanna make you the Lord of my life in every area. Help me to walk in the new life that I now have. Fill me with your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's thank the Lord across the room. Thank you, Jesus.